coming up in this episode. But to walk just up one level for a second on that kind of rabbit hole we're in, um, if you have prepared for a funding round, and what I mean prepared, you've got a pitch deck, a forecast, you've got a term sheet, you know your valuation, you've got your SEIS, EIS, advanced assurance. So you've got the five basics in place there. Uh, if you can articulate your vision in a passionate way that people can understand, uh, if everything is sane about your business, so you know, no crazy valuation, no tiny, tiny market and all of those kind of things, you'll get funded. One way or another, you'll get funded. I would really love to see more people, more, more diversity um, in, 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 those, in those entry level jobs really or at entry level but uh, entry to senior level role you know roles like in sales in 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 the developer community in tech i would really like to see that because i think that's where it starts and and i suppose you could you know really draw that all the way back to its its, its obvious conclusion which is even schools you know and, and really? colleges not doing enough to interest uh young girls in technical subjects and in in the sciences and you know in stem in general he took on investment not using our paperwork but using the investors paperwork and uh, ended up losing control of his business. Mm -hmm. I won't say any more than that. And I won't say any more than that. But it sat very, very, very badly with me. Um, and I keep seeing challenges like that. And actually, that problem is entirely preventable. Welcome to Founders Unplugged, hosted by Greg McCallum. Long form, honest conversations with founders and entrepreneurs from around the world. This is part two of this episode. Be sure to check out part one if you haven't already. Enjoy. I want to ask you. A bit more broadly, what are some of the things that people aren't talking about in the startup space, in the startup ecosystem, that people should be talking about, in your view? God, I, and I think some of this will come down to the injustices. Let's start there, because they're the things that, like you know, that. that mm -hmm. really sit in my... Uh, yeah. What they, grinds your gears? Yeah, they really yeah, they, do. Maybe this is what we should call this section. What grinds your gears? <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's so many rants here, and... Um, Good, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, where to start? I mean, there are so many injustices. And the problem is some of these are, you know, everybody's been talking about, you know, the amount of investment that goes to female and other underrepresented founders. You know, we know it's 2%. We know it's been a problem for the fast, last five years. We know UK BAA has championed it. We know everybody talks about it. I don't know about you, Greg, but I haven't seen anything happen that's, that has shifted the dial there. And I think there are, you know, and it's not yet there are genuinely problems out there that are intractable right there are but, but, but what's the data behind because I, I i haven't done the research on that i'll be honest uh, you know um I, so i don't know but i'm curious because if, is that is that not in is that not proportionate given the amount of women that are founders no is it not no okay. I, I I wish if I had known that question would come up i'd have bought some stats to the call but no i'm not i'm not trying to sort of but my and I'm and I'm going to make up a number which I think is there or thereabouts, and I'll confirm afterwards. Mm. Uh, you know, our customers. It's not quite fifty-fifty. I think we've got. We certainly do have a male bias, but it's not significant. It's right. something like forty-sixty. Oh really? Um, oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So it, there are lots and lots of female founders, and there yeah there are lots of ethnically diverse founders and things like that. So the problem is not representation in the cohort. It is not a you know if if it were you know one in ten female one in ten you know, if the numbers worked out and it was saying everybody would try and go, well, there's just not enough female founders. That's a different problem. There are female founders to invest in. Right. They're just not getting the money. Um, and ditto every other class of underrepresented founders, in, in my experience. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I think there is genuinely a problem rather than it being a fluke of who is within the cohort. And and we think, is the is the conclusion solid that it, it, it has to be from some level of of, of bias or prejudice? I, I mean, I, I think that's the conclusion lots of people draw. And I think that would be an easy conclusion to to jump to. I, I think you've got to be really clear, really careful when you interpret the data. Because mm -hmm. when you see, you know, there were, and I'm going to make some numbers up because I can't remember off the top of my head, but, you know, there was 30, million raise, 30 billion raised across all of the equity space. And, you know, female founders got 2% of that. Uh, or female founding teams. Now, this is where you've got to be really, really careful with the numbers because, you know, if you look at quite often at the higher end of that, you know, the me raising 250K isn't going to contribute massively to that. Whereas if you've got a business that's raised, just raised 20 million from SoftBank, then that is going to shift the dial. So, you know, the big numbers, the, the bigger investments will shift the dial much more than lots of smaller investments. And I think as by the time you get to, 
very big business, you know, very big businesses that are raising hundreds or tens or hundreds of millions. You've got already got a diverse founding team. Hopefully you've got a diverse set of directors and therefore they wouldn't be counted as all female founding teams. So I think you need to be careful with that. You know, the data's it's so sparse that it, you know it's so and what you end up with is consolidated data that you can't really draw much out but even if you look at uh you know pre-seed pre-revenue and you ignore the statistical bias at the top end there um you know females founders genuinely find it harder to raise and they get more risk-based questions even what's interesting is even from other female angel investors female mm -hmm. angel investors ask female founders different questions they would a male the psychology of it is is genuinely interesting mm -hmm. and like I say, there's lots of awareness of it. Lots of people who have been championing the cause. I There isn't a lot of action that I see that happens to solve the problem. And that's because I think it's really hard. If, if they're a magic wand, then UK BAA, who are massive champions for this cause, would have done something. And I do think this is where, you know, having a, making the investor community more diverse is a really, really good thing. So, um, you know, if you go to any of the private equity club and angel networks, those kind of you know the biases that we talk about are represented in those groups so predominantly middle-aged white white men um now you know bpec was very good it had uh some ethnic diversity and it had some female you know some very strong female investors as well heather franklin was a member of bpec is a member of angel investors bristol is a massive name within the startup ecosystem as a very very supportive investor for example but but statistically there are very few females so actually if I, I think if you broaden the investor base then that will be that will be great for where they end up investing but, but isn't this all part of a of a journey and also i should point out i am i am very conflicted on the subject of diversity as a whole and i have some pretty strong opinions on on certain aspects of it especially as it pertains to identity politics and some of the problematic areas that i believe exist within that which we we don't we don't have to get into. But 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 uh, unless you want to. Um, but but so I but I am very conflicted. But I I, I also see that. Um, and I but so on one hand I, I absolutely agree that we need to see more diversity. But on the other, I think it's very dangerous to try and force that diversity. Yes. So so we have to be very careful. But what I find interesting, you mentioned there about some of the, you know not even seeing uh, the diversity among investors. I mean, doesn't that follow that if you don't have many founders funded to then go on to have successful exits to then potentially become investors? It, it, it all starts. And if we were to go even further back than then, um, even going back to what you were talking about, finding founders to, who are investable, right? Investable founders. It, it has to be the stars have to align in a number of different ways. And one of the there's one either one of two key traits that seems to always come up, right, to, to make a, a, an investor highly foundable, uh, investable. Um, it's either, like you said, incredible presentation skills, sales skills, right? Which I think is 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 a no brainer. Like it's an incredibly important thing. Charisma, presentation, excellent communication, yeah. commanding the room, all of that. That's that's essentially sales, right? Yeah. Sales is sure. communication. Communication is sales, right? That's that number one. Or it's highly technical, right? E expertise in an area, uh, you know, a, a domain expert, right? Yeah. Someone that you're like, they really get this, and they've solved an incredible, mind blowing problem in this space. That yeah. you know, like 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 that example you gave, where someone needed a PhD to do DD. Yeah. Um, we don't have an enormous amount of diversity within the space of engineering and especially within sales. Like I, I know I've worked in I, my, my background is in running sales and marketing teams. Sales is a predominantly male dominated uh, yeah. sector um, because it's highly competitive. It, it is, it, you know, it, it, there, there are problems there for sure, for sure, where especially in some industries, it's, it's quite misogynistic, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, and more is being done to, well, some stuff is being done there, but not as much as is being done in the tech side of things to encourage more more women to, 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 join, uh, to join that sort of thing. So again, doesn't it follow that if we get more there, we get more experienced individuals who then go on to found companies who then are have a broader skill set which mitigates the risk and then they don't get asked as many risk related questions even by female investors and then they have successful ex exits and they go on to be uh potential investors themselves is it is that not the root cause of the problem as opposed to just you know it, focusing on this middle bit because that middle bit concerns me again that we might be rigging it a little bit of if we focus on that too much um, and in some ways, potentially um, being prejudiced to everyone else to try and accommodate 
that 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 sort of that mission, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's certainly a chicken. That in was it. a complicated question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got to pass the question again. Um, I mean, it's certainly there's certainly a chicken and egg here. To yeah. you know, under uh, underlying is there aren't enough investors, therefore uh, female investors, therefore they're not investing in female founders, therefore therefore you know there and you know therefore there are not many founders who have female founders that have successful exits who become investors, and around and around and around we go. I, I think we have, you know, in violent agreement on that point. Mm. And I think, I, I suspect there's no panacea here. There's no single thing that will solve the problem. I think there are amazing groups like Emmy Faust, uh, Female Founder Rise. I think, you know, we, um, yeah, I absolutely love Emmy. I love her mission. I love the community she's building. And I, you know, I think if there is a, one of the forces for good that will help solve this problem, um, or at least, you know, rebalance, um, you know, I absolutely have faith in her because she is laser focused on solving solving that problem uh, mm -hmm. and has the skills to do it and, and the community and the, the kind of, yeah, she's got the uh, momentum behind her. And, and also, as I mentioned in the last episode, I think, you know, uh, Andy Aheem's Open Angel thing, that education piece about being, bringing a much more diverse pool of uh, investors into the space, you know, younger investors and more ethnically diverse and more, you know, uh, more female investors and, and everybody who can and, and wants to invest in this space rather than it being, um, you know, frankly, lots of me investing, which is terrifying, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a panacea. I, I you know, I, I think I, I've i pulled the plaster off the, 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 you know, the most challenging, what I see injustice in this space and the yeah. most well documented. You know, everybody knows this is this is a problem and i think there is a general and yeah there's a general will to to solve it it's just yeah cool. yeah it's just it's just tricky because of it, you know, it there's there's so much emotion behind it too and 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 there's a, there's a lot of people um i think you know trying to use a hammer to fix the problem as well and so we have i think we need to be delicate you know we need to be very delicate with it with, with when trying to solve these problems yeah but i agree with you i yeah i i want to see i, I would really love to see more people more more diversity um in 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 those in those entry level jobs really or at entry level but uh, entry to senior level role you know roles like in sales in 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 the developer community in tech i would really like to see that because i think that's where it starts and and i suppose you could you know really draw that all the way back to its its, it's obvious conclusion which is even schools you know and, and yeah. colleges not doing enough to interest uh young girls in technical subjects and in in the sciences and you know in stem in general well i, I think it, it starts there really if we really want to go deep into the in the weeds on that no, um i think you're absolutely right and this is you know we have a startup ecosystem problem for sure but i think it's representative of a much broader problem and to bring this to life i mean obviously uh you know i'm as old as jesus is flip-flop currently but uh, when i did a degree <laughs> in computer science um you know we, we had one uh there was one female member out of 150 people on a degree in computer science which is you know i'm sure it's not like that now i'm sure it's not like that now but mm. you know I, I i think it and i'm sure there's more representation but i'm sure that's not a solved problem across all of the stem sciences so right. um yeah i think there's a more systemic problem yeah yeah which 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 thankfully i, I know there are a lot of organizations out there trying to, yeah. to solve that problem which is which i i do think is the genesis of it it's like it, it's it's solving the root cause as opposed to trying to treat the symptom a lot of the time but but it, you equally need to have people across the board doing doing lots of things which like you said there are there are some great people doing um yeah that's that's interesting what what are some other things then because that you said you mentioned that there's a there's a couple so what are some other injustices that we can injustices. We can, let's solve. Let's solve the problems now. Let's just you know. Let's find a solution. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> um, so yeah, there's a really lovely phrase that Daniel from Shipshape has given me, which is around lemon markets. And I'm going to misuse what is actually quite a well-known economic theory, apparently. But um, and that is where uh, you know both sides of a marketplace are disadvantaged by using that marketplace. They don't know they're being disadvantaged. This is you know a lemon market, as it's phrased. And let me. I'm not going to name organizations here. I'm not going to, I, but I'm going to, what I'm going to do is talk Go about principles. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to talk about some principles, okay? And yeah, you know, let's look at um, you know, let's pick on let's pick on a class. I will pick on a class. So there are some SEIS funds out there that I think you could naturally class as a lemon market, in as much as if you could receive funding from any other source other than 
uh, one of these the specific SEIS funds, then you would. You would naturally do it because their term sheet is, you know, in our, they're used as an example in our toxic term sheet. And this isn't about an organization. There are a couple that sit within that space that are, I think, are genuinely exploitative. Um, the, the law, you know, you would not take out of choice their uh, their term sheet because it has ridiculous fees. It's very, very, very investor friendly term sheet, even though it's under SEIS, EIS, it's very cake and eat it in that respect. Hi, a friendly reminder to share this episode with your network, like and subscribe. And if you are feeling really supportive, please consider reviewing the show on the podcast platform of your choice. It all really helps support what we do. Thank you. Now back to the show. And um, and for me as an investor, if I see, uh, you know, some of the SEIS funds on a cap table, you know, I, I went to a pitch event and somebody proudly shouted out that angle, like, well, that's, that is not the badge of honor you think it is because, you know, out of every investor, 270,000 angel investors in the UK, 130 angel groups, you know, 20 odd SEIS funds or whatever there are, you know, you thought that was the best choice and they were the people that, either the only people that offered you an investment or you thought they were a good choice which i think speaks speaks to that decision making pr um process and again it's an edu education thing that the founders think that that is you know think that that is a good outcome whereas in reality any other outcome would have been from you know all the way to finding angel investors to you know private equity clubs to crowdfunding would have been better options for them in the in the and and i feel sorry for people that invest in those groups because you know, anybody who, you know, the, the cream of the crop are not ending up. Usually this is a gross, you know, there are some very, very good companies, but the cream of the crop are getting snapped up by angel investors or private equity clubs before people get to that point of raising there. So they're receiving a lemon, you know, they're, they're only buying in a lemon market because the only thing on sale are companies who have fallen through all of the other cracks. And for me, that's, again, that's an education thing. And I think, you know, I'm not, if a founder decides whatever funding for them is the right choice i think that's great i i just think not is known enough about and, and founders are vulnerable at the point in raising you know they start raising they're three months in they can see their cash runway if somebody offers a 250k ticket and says we'll nearly close your round you know it, I, I get it the psychology of it is i will take that money because actually there's you know there's not a lot of choice but it's thinking through the implication and what the other choices are along mm. the journey um yeah, it that, takes a lot of balls to say no at that specific point, right? But yeah, it's very understandable that the answer would probably be yes. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know I think that's and that's a that's an unknown injustice because actually people just blindly walk into it. People right. you know people accept and think oh, I've got an offer on the table. It can't be that bad. But if you see what a normal cap table from an angel you know with an angel sorry a normal term sheet with an angel looks like versus the SCIS funds, and it is. You know, it's worse in every material respect. It's, yeah, it's just worse. They're, you know, forcing you to capitalize your director's loan accounts. So if you've got 100K in a director's loan, great, you've got to buy shares at the same valuation as us. So you're mm. turning your 100 grand. You've got consents and, you know, investor director rights, which are, you know, vaguely market standard. Um, you've got to use their legals. You've got a 12% fee, um, which isn't benefit anybody other than the people that run the funds. So there's just um, yeah, there's just chip chip own you know reset of vesting to three years with a one year cliff, even though you may have spent five years building your company. There's just everything is stacked against you in that term sheet. It's you know it may be market standard for an SEIS fund, but it's not market standard if you look at the broader kind of angel investment space. Mm. So so is there is there a like you said there are some some loads of resources on 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 founder catalyst for that is there a, a, a clear way of being able to sort of compare a term sheet maybe they've been given with with an example um, on on your platform or somewhere on the website where they can sort of you know put them side by side and just be like oh okay red flag red flag red flag yeah so there, there's an article specifically on toxic term sheets which calls out some of right. that behavior and that has you know that. Uh, you could compare the term sheet that you've got and you know walk down the details and say oh yeah it doesn't include this 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 um also you know i've i've always got uh, office hours open so if anybody wants to book a meeting even if you're not a customer of us i'm mm. happy to talking through your term sheet and explaining you know where it fits in terms of that you know good bad and the other that's, that's very generous of you that that's an awesome thing to offer people um 
I'm worried that uh, having announced that, you might get inundated. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, ultimately, and ultimately, Greg, I don't, I'm in that really fortunate position, I guess, you know, the, to take a step back from injustices for a second. Mm. You know, I, I, I genuinely don't care whether people join us as a customer or not. Genuinely don't care right. because I, I'm not doing this, you know, I'm A, I'm wired slightly different, but B, you know, I'm not on the normal VC treadmill, right? I, I don't have. 100 employees mouse to feed i'm not making a loss every year i'm not you know having to do bridge rounds i'm not i'm not in any of those positions so I, i'm running a business that you know i want to be able to go to sleep at night and i want to you know i want my legacy to build something that i'm incredibly pr proud of because i'm spending you know a huge i'm in, investing a huge amount of time on this but but the fact that we're not privately backed the fact that we're not you know hugely loss making means that we can do things in a different way which means that mm. we can you know, we give away pro bono rounds for really great causes. We've done half a dozen of those now. And we wow. continue doing them. Uh, it means that we don't need to be predatory with our pricing. It means that, you know, frankly, if you're raising 150, 150K or 1. 1.5 million, uh, you know, it doesn't take me five minutes longer to spend on, you know, one round than the other because we've got a SaaS platform. So actually our pricing is just a flat fee because that feels like a fair and reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means we can be generous with our time as well. It means we can have conversations. And, and like I say, whether somebody becomes a customer or not to me is, is kind of irrelevant as long as they get to the right outcome. Our fundamental thesis is, you know, and, and that may be, have you tried these grants and maybe equity fundraising isn't right for you now because there are other other ways of, of getting funded or, you know, have you thought about debt solutions or maybe, you know, where you are now, I would just continue bootstrapping it. So, uh, and if that means we don't get a customer, we'll say be it. And whether, you know, in some cases, using a lawyer is exactly the right thing to do in a funding round. You know, when you come to VC, I absolutely wouldn't use an automated platform for that because course, yeah. I would want a, you know, somebody who's paid four hundred pounds an hour and wears a nice suit to be telling me I'm doing the right or wrong thing. I wouldn't want, you know, wouldn't want anybody sat beside me. Um, so as long as people get to the right outcome, I genuinely don't mind. Yeah, like we touched on before, I'm getting, you know, I, I I definitely get a very strong sense that you and I are very aligned on this this deep need to call out in, injustice and stuff. Like I mentioned before, where do you think, have you sort of considered where that comes from, you know, in your journey, in your life, like why that's such an important, because by the sounds of it, you're, you're, you're very, like you just admitted, essentially, you're, you're very, very focused on, on social impact of Founder Catalyst. But where does that sort of drive come from to be, to be so concerned with 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 addressing some of the the injustices and 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 mistreatments of individuals and trying to level the playing field where, where does that come from you know? uh, i guess you know so i find myself myself in the fortunate position of having you know having a material exit by accident largely i you know my career was never set up my you know my background would not have allowed me to become an entrepreneur in my early years because i you know I wouldn't have had the you know the ability to support that i wouldn't have had the family and friends that would have been able to invest in things like that so i find myself in a really 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 fortunate position and um and, and i i feel that you know having been an accidental entrepreneur and now absolutely caught the bug i think it's a real privilege but i don't think it's a privilege that should just be available to people who have you know rich parents who can go oh don't worry don't worry about your legals, Tarquin. We can get, you know, our dad's lawyer will fix it. And uh, the Tarquin, dog. great. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I've got... Uh, Apologies yeah. to any Tarquins listening. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, but but I don't think it should just be reserved for, you know, people who get 50 grand from mum and dad who can afford to pay lawyers or can afford to pay expensive platform fees. Or, you know, I think everybody should have the ability if they want to have a go at becoming a, becoming a founder and and that that's drives from you know education and accessibility and all of those kind of things mm -hmm. and having you know very high entrance fees and things like that it just doubles down on you know it it being harder to become an entrepreneur and therefore it being reserved for you know people with with privileged backgrounds and that that really really doesn't sit well with me so if i look at you know the pro bono work we're doing it's always you know it's always underrepresented founders um who yeah who are who i who i think would be would be great to support mm. and and yeah and and i guess when i started angel investing i spotted you know i've seen some pretty pretty bad behavior from the founder side and i'd you know i'd love to touch on that quickly um but also on the you know on the investor mm. side i've seen um you know somebody i would cast uh, i won't use his full name 
because he'll probably get sued, but or I'll get sued even better. But um, you know, there was a there was a young underrepresented founder who really built a lovely business, and I, you know, I was uh, supporting. Not again. This isn't with a founder catalyst hat on. This was me being an informal advisor to him and kind of holding his hand through a journey. He'd spent a few years building. I mean, he was, you know, only twenty, so he'd spent a few years, basically all of his working life, building something. He took on investment, not using our paperwork, but using the investors' paperwork, and uh, ended up losing control of his business. Mm-hmm. I won't say any more than that. And I won't say any more than that. But it sat very, very, very badly with me. Um, and you, I keep seeing challenges like that. And actually, that problem is entirely preventable. If he'd have used our paperwork or a decent lawyers or um, even our competitors, it doesn't matter really. Just anything but. An investor-led paperwork he'd have been safe but the way that the paperwork was engineered he put himself at risk and and that's an education thing because everybody should know at this stage if you're pre-seed pre-revenue and unless it's a crowd funder um yeah if you're just talking to normal angels this was normal angels that invested it or in this case normal angels in inverted commas but you should the founder should be producing the legal documentation it's your job as a founder to produce the term sheet to produce the legal docs and then people may negotiate but they'll adopt that it's very unusual to say angel to see angels say you've got to use our paperwork and that's a that would be a red flag for me as a founder because mm. every time i've seen it you know something you know something goes wrong um yeah yeah well so you you were touching there as well on uh some some red flags uh, or, or some bad actors from from founders and what, what what did you mean by that yeah i mean i mean if i speak... aside, aside from the, the, the one you just mentioned but yeah yeah i mean that was uh, so the, the founder or investors being uh right yeah which, which side of the coin the, do the, you want... the founder you were saying that there's, there's there were some there's been some examples of of that that you wanted to touch on yeah so um i mean i so look at one of my investments you know i invested in a company in good faith oh, i i put a relatively large ticket you know a couple of funding rounds into this company and um one day i got a goo uh, an alert from company's house saying oh this company's filed for liquidation right no heads up no nothing no heads up no conversation no communication and um yeah and that really really that really uh it really stang actually at a personal level it you know under seis and eis great i've got lost relief i'm losing 28 percent of my cash um and I, but it just you know the yeah it sang on a uh, on a personal level it didn't sit well with me at all mm. and if i compare that with right not every startup's going to work out i've had i've got 32 investments i've probably had six or seven that failed i've had one exit as well i'd love to talk about that everybody loves mm. talking about success um but but the one but the one that failed in that fashion if i compare it with an alternative there was a company i invested in it was a static drone company so it's a drone on a tether for military purpose can stay up for days on end i really love the idea and i love jim the founder he's such a such a gent really really lovely guy and uh he tried to make it work unfortunately the sales cycle in to defense is ridiculously long and corona happened and 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 so that business didn't work out and i tell you what jim couldn't have handled that with more integrity if he tried he phoned us all individually he sent us a letter he made sure that all of the closure admin was done in a way that we could claim our tax relief and and i tell you what if jim opened the company tomorrow even though his first startup didn't work out i'd invest in it because i really rate him as a person and i love his integrity integrity to me is worth more than absolutely anything absolutely and that bridge hasn't been burnt no, and that bridge, but you, but you couldn't be more stark between closing a company on company's house and just disappearing um, versus you know the way that he handled it. Um, mm. And there's a life lesson there, right? It cost it cost Jim nothing. It cost him an hour of his time to write a letter and put ten calls in. And and I remember, you know, I'm talking about him on a on a podcast. Mm. Um, whereas the other guys, you know, it's it's just very very bad. So did you ever did you ever hear from those other guys? No, no, no. no they closed, they the closed a year ago, and I'm still. I'm still stewing at some point. I may fire a legal letter in on that. Um, I, I can see that. Yeah, you're still a little. Uh, yeah, I'm still a little. Uh, Do you ever find out why it, it, it decided to go nope. to liquidate? No, I've never found out. I mean, the basic. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, and that's, I mean, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, it could be you know something medical or you know I don't know. Right. Yeah, there were there were a few people in the business that could have uh, put a call in, and it's That's uh, right, right, yeah, yeah. So yeah, anyway. not not good form, not good form. But yeah, tell us about this exit then. Um, 
yeah, so the, the exit is the opposite end of the spectrum. So uh, I invested in, uh, and this is where the, the game of investing, even though the outcome was great, it was it was a little bit of a rocky road. So right. I'm investing in uh, in a gaming company. Uh, you know, they make computer games, which is a ridiculously acquisitive space. Mm. Um, and I didn't expect that to be in your portfolio. I'll be honest. I didn't expect <laughs> it to be in my portfolio. Um, and I'm not a gamer myself. But anyway, they um, I saw them pitch. It was a local business, and I really liked the founder. I really liked the team. Um, yeah, and they, you know, they they genuinely seem to have a good product roadmap for the, what little I know about gaming. So I invested in that business, and um, yeah, two years and ten months into the investment, they sent an email around going, "Yeah, great, um, great news. We're going to exit the business this month without an offer we can't refuse." I was like, "Brilliant!" And I was like, "Well, hang on, you're investing within three years of my uh, SEIS investment, which means you destroy all of your tax relief." Um, so I put a little call into the founder. I said. Just so you know, you're about to destroy everybody's tax relief who's invested, you know, several hundred thousand pounds into you. Could, would you mind delaying the transaction a little? And the answer was no, no, you know, it's got to be done quickly. There's another event happening and da, 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 da. So I voiced my displeasure, um, as you'd imagine, Greg. I voiced my displeasure on that outcome. And then, no, are you? <laughs> who knew? Who knew? Um, anyway. So I, uh, yeah, I voiced my displeasure, but then kind of went, oh, an exit is an exit. And, and inevitably the transaction was delayed and it was three years and one month after our investment. We kept our tax relief. Um, it was an interesting exit. So the exit consisted of a couple of parts. Um, the first part was upfront consideration and normal exit deal. So if, when I exited my IT business, you don't get all of your money on day, day one. There's some loan note, loan note or deferred consideration. So there's always some way of structuring a deal but in this case that was applied to investors as well which i found a really interesting nuance that i hadn't expected um so we got half of our money up front and then a couple of years later the other half and uh, and all as well and it was you know roughly an 11 times return which wow. you know it's not bad and if you um now's probably a good time to talk into what a good return looks like for an angel mm -hmm. investor and um we did some statistical analysis of uk baa figures and the answer basically is 3.1 times your money so if you put in a broad enough portfolio you should get three times roughly that money back over a long enough period mm -hmm. um now if you only wait make across, across the whole portfolio uh, yeah that's the blended because you'll have right. you know seven out of ten will either fizzle or just return you your money if they fizzle then you're only risking 28 percent under seis anyway right because you've got the other 72% covered by tax relief. Um, but yeah, broadly, you should get three times your money. So this is that was a really great return, 11 times return. Mm, um, and that will help to offset some of the, you know, some of the fizzles I've had anyway. Mm. Some of the ones that ghost you and close their, their companies now. Yeah, companies awkward. Down. That's awkward, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What, what, are, um, what are some of the things about exits that, that people don't know about you you touched a couple of them there but what are some other aspects that like you said that, 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 that there's terms but but also you know quite often founders are asked to stay on for a period of time uh you know and, and sort of there's a there's a slow exit there too what what are some other things around around exits that that you think both founders and investors should probably know about that isn't talked about enough yeah i mean exits a fascinating space and um it, it, as i as i mentioned in our in part one of this but part of the reason for starting founder catalyst was for me scratching an itch i'd started scratching an itch on you know what is what's the whole world of early stage equity fundraising about and here i am running a platform that supports both sides undertake mm -hmm. you know millions and millions and millions of transactions a year we're in in transactions a year which which i really enjoy i've got another itch to scratch in the exit space so our journey in Founder Catalyst is, um, I'm not saying drawing to a close, as in I'm closing the company, that's not happening, but it's, you know, we're kind of feature complete when it comes to funding rounds. There's a few bells and whistles we're going to add, but there's only so many nuance and polish you can do to a funding round. We do them, we've got a ridiculously good track record, and, 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 that's that. I think there are other parts of the entrepreneurial journey that I have an itch to scratch, and now I've discovered that there are real problems to solve there. One is right. around the exit space, so um my my ideas in this area are forming but it will certainly be yeah education and a platform pay play and and this is an area i'm very conscious i've only been through once i've only been through one exit but it was a fascinating process and you know we've, we've only got 20 minutes left or whatever i do not have time to get do justice to 
the process of an exit. It's fascinating. And in the same way, you know, lots of people do funding rounds, lots of people do multiple funding rounds. And there's a there's a really well trodden path doing a funding round. The same is true for an exit. You know, you right. if you if you understand how to play the game, you'll be considering an exit and an, uh, an exit three years before you even start the process. For example, you will build your business, you will preen the business and you can't do that overnight. You can't say we're going to sell tomorrow. You can't start preening your business from that point because you know some of the damage is done. And I'll give you, can I give you one ridiculous example? You're Please, late. I love examples, especially ridiculous ones. <laughs> so we, um, in our business, we were thinking of exiting in a year's time, but we wanted to, you know, we were we wanted to be a really good employer. We were a really good employer. We had an option scheme so that everybody could participate in the exit as well. But we wanted to polish our headquarters. So you know, everything had a lick of paint. We put some bean bag, we you know, bean bags and all of that good stuff. And we bought pool tables and ping pong tables. We spent, I don't know, call it a hundred thousand pounds on a, you know, a solid refurb of this business. Um, yeah, it was and we, at the same time we put a network operations center in. When we came to the exit, you know, and that, it cost us a hundred thousand pounds out of the pocket, which is okay, that's fine. When we came to an exit, what you don't realize is your exit is a function of your EBIT times a multiple, which in our case was 10. They took the EBIT, they times it by 10. That is what it is. Our EBIT was roughly three million, say. So, you know, three times 10, the exit price was three million. But if you, when we look back, they took the hundred thousand pounds off, you know, that was taken off our EBIT the year before. And that was the year they calculated our exit on. So that hundred thousand pounds didn't cost us a hundred thousand pounds. It cost a hundred thousand pounds EBIT times the 10 multiple on exit. So it right. cost us a million quid. It's the most expensive <laughs> ping pong table and uh, pool table ever. And, right. And there is a thing, so when you're negotiating, you can argue that um, there are things called takeaway and addbacks on your EBIT where you say that was an exceptional item that shouldn't be in there or you should add this. Um, but obviously an exit's a negotiation and the kind of acquirer just went, absolutely not. You spend the money, it's off your EBIT, bad luck. So yeah, it genuinely costs us a million quid to um, yeah, to polish, to polish our uh, offices, which is... Wow. The most expensive refurb you'll ever hear of, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um. Yeah, but, so going back to the point um, without climbing out of this rabbit hole, um, mm. in terms of the exits, there's just a million things that people don't understand. And it is, um, you know, it's the first time I'd ever uh, came into contact with something called warranties and indemnities, and therefore a disclosure process. And you get these in funding rounds, actually where um, within the shareholders agreement, there are a bunch of statements called warranties, which um, should be or could be statements of fact. And some of them, are, you know, they go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Some of them will be something like, you know, the company isn't being sued for anything, which should be true, but may not be, who can tell. There's another warranty which says, you know, uh, you don't own any premises, which is much more um, benign. If you are enjoying this episode and want to support the show, please like, subscribe with notifications turned on, and let us know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. This lets YouTube know we are doing something right. Back to the show. And um, yeah, what's interesting is, so each of these are statements of fact. And if the, if the statement of fact is true, you don't need to do anything. So if you're not being sued, you don't own any premises, you don't rent any premises, you don't need to disclose anything. But if any of those statements is untrue in any way, and, and the onus is on you to decide whether it's entirely true or not, um, then you create something called a disclosure. And a disclosure, you would say, oh yeah, we're being sued by you know, one of our suppliers because we haven't paid them and, you know, oh, we ran somebody over in the car park and they're suing us as well, whatever, whatever it is. And as long as you do that, it's fine. The, it, it, and it makes sure that the investor is investing in your business or acquiring your business with full knowledge of the business. They're not, there's nothing missing. There's no, um, yeah, there are no items missing from, you know, from their knowledge of your business. Now, if you don't take that process seriously, if you don't include um a disclosure against any of the warranties and indemnities then you could be sued for breach of contract and that's you know really really painful you don't want that so it's absolutely worth taking seriously on the bright side if you're an early stage business if you're a year old startup that doesn't employ anybody you haven't got premises you've not built a product yet you know it's really really it, you would have to be going out of your way to breach any of these warranties and um they're, they're that kind of straightforward enough when you've spent four years building a business and you're at 30 million revenue you've got you know 100 odd employees you know dozens and dozens of customers 
even in that small time, you will have dozens and dozens and dozens of warranties um, and indem indemnities to disclose against. And in our case, in the exit process, I think the warranty and indemnity schedule was something like 100 pages of questions. And every single question, you've got a deep dive. And it's not just you. You've got to ask everybody in your board and your finance manager and the HR manager. You've got to make inquiries so that, you know, you can answer with certainty that the answer you're giving is correct. And, and what you find, you know, some of the questions are ridiculous, like, um, you don't have any employees. If you do, then include them in a schedule. So you will always include a schedule of employees. Mm -hmm. Some will be, you know, every, you know, no employees left the business under anything other than a resignation or whatever. And because they're trying to find, you know, HR issues that have been stored up in case the tribunal comes down the line later on. And actually going through 100 pages of that process was both fascinating, time consuming and terrifying in, each, in equal measure. Mm. Um, because the, the implications of getting it wrong are you could get sued, um, you know, for not disclosing something you should. And that's, and it's such a weird process to get, you know, it's such an unusual process. Um, and I know it's in funding rounds and lots of founders get to touch it there, but on an exit, it's like a turbocharged version of that. It's fascinating. Um, and so, so, you know, f following that logic, I can totally see what you're saying about, <clears throat> uh, about well, a why founder capitalist would would want to try and help facilitate that using the similar sort of frameworks and things that you've learned over the years, but but also b the, the idea that you know plan three years ahead of time, like because it, because presumably a lot of the those those processes you can you can make a start on, so you're not kind of at the the very end scrambling to try and get it all to happen in a, in a short period of time. Um, which inevitably will will result in errors and 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 like you say, put you at risk, right? So presumably there's a lot of stuff you can do throughout the running of your business that can in some way prepare you for that for that moment whether it's information gathering just just being organized with the way you store information um etc right yeah and, th and there is a moment in every business and uh you know I've, I've started quite a few businesses now and everyone goes through this glorious process at the moment where it's like anarchy everybody's doing everything right, and right. you're just trying to put the basics in place Nobody's particularly worried about process. Nobody's because there's only a few of you. You all know what each other's doing. You're, you're just getting it done. You're, right? yeah, yeah, JFDI. There yeah. becomes a point where hopefully it's not when you get bitten in the butt by this, but there becomes a point where you know that anarchy turns into a problem rather than a good thing. And then you build processes. You build, you know, right. you have somebody responsible for finance who who is doing everything. So when you're doing a disclosure process, for example, you've got all of your invoices in one place. You've got your VAT reconciliation. You've got your HR files. You're, you know, you don't just fire somebody on a voice call. You send them a letter to formalize it. But, you know, as every business will naturally hit that maturity point. And from then onwards, I guess the benefit of being of being a later in life founder, you know, when I became an accidental entrepreneur, I was nearly 40. So, um, you know, I'd been through and I kind of knew what could look like in terms of those mm. regular keepings, the diligence, the process. And therefore, there weren't actually any skeletons in our uh, closet when we left. Um, but yeah, getting that stuff in early, because the problem is if you start an exit process and people start due diligence, I had no idea how painful commercial due diligence and financial due diligence would be. It was it was eye watering, genuinely eye watering. And I think, and we were in, you know, we ran a tight ship by that point. We had all of our ISOs in place. We had, you know, very thorough HR and finance and customer records and everything. And, but if you go into the process, it will prepare it. I mean, I think lots of deals fall away just because people underestimate the, the maturity you need your business in to successfully go through that process. Mm -hmm. And 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 one last quick question before I I let you leave. I I have a million more, but we'll have to end it there. Um, the 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 typically when when it comes to an exit, are you seeing um, organisations actually go out to seek that exit, or are they typically being approached for that exit, or is it a pretty even split? It's a really yeah, it's a really um, fine balance. I think yeah, I think it's, it's there's a good split here. So some of our customers, founder catalyst customers, they'll sign up. They'll sign up to do a funding round before they even close their first funding round. They've been acquired, and oh, you wow. go well, that happened quickly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've seen that happen a few times. It's it's usually somebody spotting what they're doing is interesting. Sometimes it's consolidation in the startup space where you know it's an acquire hire where 
somebody's already doing something and they think actually you're in an adjacent space let's bolt you on and bring our teams together sometimes it's a much more mature business that like the ip or whatever um but if i look at what how we exited so the trigger point for our exit was winning you know sunday times tech track second fastest growing company in the uk we were very intentional about exiting exiting at that point but as soon as we won it the very next day you get you know the phone was ringing off the hook with peas going oh you know we're not you know we know you're not in the market yet but could we meet you for a coffee so that was really nice to have that kind of inbound interest mm. um and there's a um within the it is very sector specific but there's a um a publication publication called megabyte which track every early stage it company and we were listed in there at some point and again i think i had to change my mobile number because people are just very up going oh great you know we we hear you you know potentially doing a transaction in a couple of years it's and that again is really nice to have that inbound um it, personally i I think it's better if the founding team are intentional about an exit because like i say you know i think we are halfway through the point you you know you need to polish a couple of years out ideally right. you need to send six you need to spend six months preening the business creating an up-to-date information memor memorandum you need to think about succession planning so in my case i wanted to me and one of my co-founders wanted to exit the business at the same time leaving another two directors so we had to kind of make ourselves redundant if you like during that process we couldn't look meaningful to the business because otherwise you would kind of tie yourself to the to the next roll of the dice um you know you need to prepare all your documentation you need to brief each of the key members of the management team who will be involved with the process you need to find a corporate finance advisor you need to find accountants that you love you need to find a law firm and all of these things take their they kind of feel small in isolation but actually they it all of it adds up and all of it's incredibly time consuming mm -hmm. and then you need to um you need to and this i remember this meeting you need to sit down with your kind of board and say right and there were four of us in this case and it was you know a very protracted and at some point heated conversation you say right who's going to stay and who's going to go okay great what are our red lines on this transaction you know and and at that point when you're working with when you've got four of you in the board if you're not exiting your interests are all very much aligned uh because um yeah you you want to grow the business you want to maximize ebit you want to maximize enterprise value so you're very aligned when well, as soon as two of you are leaving and two of you are going actually your interests aren't aligned anymore right. because you know uh, to you to give a really daft example as an exited found exiting founder i'm going to want the maximum value from my business so i don't really care who's going to buy the business i i care about the check they're going to write if you're one of the two people staying in the business actually you want the most uh founder friendly the most patient capital you can get in your business because otherwise you're going to have a really really tough ride yeah. and i don't really care whether they're patient or not i care about maximizing value and it's really interesting so you start with your list of red lines and you're all on the same page about you know we only want this much loan notes we want this up front minimum ebits there's minimum da, 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 minimum multiples this so you can come up with your red lines but very soon actually you're both building your own mental red lines because mm. their interests are slightly sometimes and sometimes diametrically opposed to yours another example is um you know when i exited i wanted my restrictive uh covenants to be a minimum period possible so there is a very likely scenario that i exit i'm a little bit of an idiot i exit and i uh you know go to a casino drunk and spend all of my money and i need to work in it again right that is thankfully it didn't happen but that was not beyond uh <laughs> beyond every guess and um i don't gamble by the way but uh you get my point so i could have made a bad choice and then you just you just angel invest instead that's fine. yeah <laughs> it's not gamble it's a sure thing don't you worry of course it is yeah <laughs> um, but 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 yeah there was a serious chance that at some point in my future i may have had to work again and you know the the people who were saying were like we don't want you working in the industry for 10 years i'm like that's ridiculous so i you know say i lose all of my money say you sue me to get all of the money back the company sues me under a um you know a warranty claim for example say you get all of the money you pay me back you're then saying you've got the money and i can't work in the industry the only thing i could do at that point is work in it so i'm trying to get that number to be as small as possible and they're trying to get that number to be as large as possible so i don't go out and automatically create another it company so there's a real tension there and, and inevitably like every negotiation you kind of end up at some 
uh, I would say compromise, but everybody feels like they haven't got the answer they wanted, but they kind of grumblingly agree. Because you ultimately, you know, that's one of the negotiations where you need to agree, otherwise there's no deal to be done. It's, it's that black and white. There's no, yeah, you can't paper over that that decision. So it's, it's a fascinating process. And, and for me, it's, um, I didn't understand that there would, I didn't understand the concept of those, any of the red lines to start, but the diverging red lines between, you know, the stayers and the goers, and then you've got the investors coming in. And then you, and and even in that very straightforward transaction, there's a, it's a multi-party agreement. So you've got the leaving founders, the remaining founders, you've got the investor, and then you've got the bank that sits behind them. And everybody has a totally different angle on the paperwork and the negotiation. It's, yeah, mm. it's, it's a fascinating kind of psychological experiment if nothing else yeah and i suppose that anyone listening who is very early in their journey listening to that getting the the, the impending sense of doom that, <laughs> that you know that, 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 i i suppose we have to bring it back to what we said in part one or, or maybe earlier in this part i can't remember which was it's okay not to know that stuff now don't worry about it now <laughs> just focus on the now but it's interesting and i suppose if, if you if someone did want to go and learn about it if they have the time and they're interested in it absolutely but but it is it is usually about staying focused on the here and yeah. now right but it, but it is an incredibly interesting side of things and it and it's super interesting that that's now on your roadmap but you say you're entering in a phase now with the platform where you're pretty much entering into to maintenance mode of what you've built you know it works well just keep it updated, keep it, you know, re, you know, with, with new regulation or whatever that comes yeah. in place. But then now you can enter into this next phase of of addressing exit. And I assume maybe sort of VC readiness or something like that. Are you sort of looking at those kinds of things as well? Or is it mostly the exit that's, side? That's not in my, I mean, the game changes when, you, when you're taking money from VC as a founder, okay. they push you paperwork. So they've got very expensive lawyers who... Okay. Prepare. So I, I don't. It's not a space personally. It's not a space I'm that interested in. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly want to work with VCs. No offense. Um, I'm no, very there, and I think that, like you said, the complexities there make it very difficult. And yeah, answers are very difficult. So, but 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 so the exit is really the main. The, the, that's the main kind of thing you want to facilitate looking forward. Then yeah, I mean our very next product, which we're building, is around option schemes, so EMI and unapproved mm -hmm. option schemes to incentivize employees. It, it it's. Uh, it's not a, you know, it is a major feature, but it's not something I'm passionate about. I think there is something lovely about the ownership effect where employees feel, uh, you know, much more love for a company and much more integral to its success if they own a part of the company. So I fundamentally believe in that. And, you know, we opened the EMI scheme in the business I exited, and that genuinely distributed millions to employees. So I love that. I think yeah, but but for me, that's the next logical progression. I can't get too excited about option schemes one way or another, but I think it's the next logical thing to produce. I'm much more excited about the exit mm. because for me, it's opening yet another can of worms. It's taking my single experience in this space, understanding everything there is to know. And thankfully, I've got Charles Frankow, um, Chief Legal Officer. He's genuinely amazing. And he has you know been involved with both buy it and sell side in 100 million pound plus transactions. So I've got kind of the guru to pick the brains of along the way. But the next platform will, the next element to our platform will be building that exit element, which I'm really, really excited about. Mm. And I've not heard anyone else um, addressing as well. So that that's that's very, yeah, very exciting, very exciting. Um, well, look, I think I need to let you go. You've been incredibly generous with your time, your your words, your wisdom, your your background, everything like that. And I can't thank you enough for 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 all of that and and way, way more. And hopefully everyone that's listening and watching feels the same way. So thank you again so much. And I think I managed to to to, to mute every time I coughed um pretty well. I don't know how much of that you noticed. <laughs> yeah, we're both coming off colds. It's funny we're both uh, you're you're in a cold and I'm just over a cold. It's yeah, getting yeah. a bit croaky. But it was a genuine pleasure to close this season it was, it was lovely to talk and i can't believe that's two minutes two hours ten minutes gone uh, it, i told you it's right amazing. Like, yeah it, it flies by um which i think is a sign of a good conversation exactly and like yeah i think we're we're aligned on so many things which is lovely to see yeah, as well of course definitely so we'll have to get you back um, we'll if you're up for it and maybe even next time in person we're going to be mixing some things up there we are in uh in the in the next season sponsorships depending we're working on those so uh um so yeah that would be awesome and uh i wish you have a wonderful week and weekend and um yeah i thank you again so much i really appreciate it
Thanks again. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs> you that bit out. Managed, like, oh. managed two hours of being perfectly eloquent and then right at the last. <laughs> I'm keeping they that can't in. say thanks. <laughs> I think I've got caffeine deficiency at this point. <laughs> it's great. Oh, yeah, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening and or watching. Subscribe with notifications turned on to get notified when part two comes out. While you wait, please join in the conversation in the comments below.